Hi, this week in Eureka we're going to look at the inventions of some ordinary household domestic things. Inventions which help keep the home smelling nice, clean and tidy. Now there's a familiar sound to most people nowadays, but it wouldn't have been recognised by anybody hundred years ago. No, the problem of cleaning the dirt and dust away was dealt with like this. <coughs> or like this. this. <laughs> the good old vacuum cleaner that's so commonplace for doing the job today wasn't invented until 1901. Last week we looked at the British invention of the hovercraft which blows air out to support a boat or a vehicle with Sir Christopher Cockrell using an air blower in his first experiments. And it was an air blower that in 1901 led another British genius, Hubert Cecil Booth, to invent the vacuum cleaner. Ah, oh, they lie, my dear. <laughs> Can you keep the dust down? more than poor Mary can do. It takes all day and every day to brush and feather and sweep. Why can't you design something to help with the housework, Cecil? Instead of playing around with your bridges and your factories and your great wheels. I'm building another one in Vienna, you know, my dear. <laughs> Have you ever been on a great wheel, Mary? Oh, yes, sir. I was on one last year in Blackpool, sir. Oh, built that one, didn't I? <laughs> yes. Yes, sir. Funny you should mention designing something to get rid of the dust, my dear. Mm -hmm. Had lunch today with Johnny Jackman, and he's invited Charlie Hitchin and I along to St Pancras Station tomorrow to watch a demonstration of cleaning. You'll never get rid of the dust, my dear, just by banging it from one place to the other. <laughs> <laughs> Now, may I introduce you here to Mr. Thurman? Mr. Thurman, Cecil, is an American. Ah. Yes. He's going to put his dust machine into operation in this carriage. Mr. Thurman, may I introduce you to Cecil Booth and Charles Hitchens? Hi. Sure glad to make your acquaintance, Mr. Booth, Mr. Hitchens. I hear you're a bit of an inventor yourself. Well, I dabble in this and that, Mr. Thurman. Thurman, Walt Thurman. T H U R M A double N. This is gonna knock your hat sideways, Boothie baby. <laughs> As I was telling John here, this device blows a really strong jet of air through the valve, along this pipe, and dislodged dirt and dust. I'll go start her up. Right, can you stand by the box, Mr. Hitchens? Right. Look at that dirt and dust, and the doggone shift it. Door oh, yes, right. Great. Yeah. Right. You want to push it? Get across the pool, right? Okay, let it go! Turn it off! <coughs> the air goes a bit strong. Yes, and the box isn't exactly catching the dirt. <laughs> First of it shot out of the window. And shut the goddamn window. That's what screwed it up. Perhaps you should uh, redirect the nozzle side onto the box or. May I suggest get a bigger box? Have you ever thought of suction, Mr. Thurman? No, try that, booty baby. Suction ain't the answer. Uh -uh. Maybe if we didn't milk in the valve so much, or slower. Yeah. If the initial jet of air isn't quite so strong, that's it. Okay, let her rip. Light of that Thurman. I'm sure suction would work. You just reverse the engine and suck it out. Yeah, well, where would you catch it? I mean, it would still go all over the place. Mm. Wait a minute. I've got an idea. What? Mary! Mary, could you wet this kerchief of mine, please? Wet 
it. Yes, yes, put it under the tap, wet it, wring it out, bring it back to me. That's a good girl. Hang yes, along. sir. Now watch this, Johnny. Now right. just watch. Now look here, look, look. There's just as much dust and dirt here as there is in that, that railway carriage. Yes, you know, I still reckon if you could catch it in a funnel or something, like a sweeper does. No, no, no. Ah. One wet handkerchief. Thank you, Mary. Sir? Thank you. What now you... watch this. Now listen. Now watch one. See? See, look. I suck through the linen and trap the dirt without swallowing it by my own inhalation of air. My goodness. Cecil, what are you doing? He's sucking the dust out of the sofa, Mom. <laughs> Idea for a dirt and dust remover. <laughs> yeah. I hope you don't think I'm going to go all round the room sucking out all the dirt through a wet cloth, Mom. Look at that, Johnny, that vacuum bellows engine of that French chappy from Lyon. Remember him, fellow that blew himself and his house up. Not a good idea. No, 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 no. The vacuum bellows engine principle. Oh. Sucking the air out. Yes, poor man. I read all about that. Yes, he and his maid were killed outright. He tried to suck all the air out of the house and they all blew up. Oh. I think I'm just going to go and make a cup of tea, Mum. No one's going to get blown up. <laughs> I'll develop a vacuum bellows engine sucking air through a tube, just like Thurman's, into a cloth collecting bag. That's it. A vacuum cleaner. cleaner. It was it, but not quite the simple device of the compact vacuum cleaner we know today. No, this was it. A horse-drawn, huge, powerful and noisy petrol-driven engine called Puffing Billy, manufactured by Booth's own vacuum cleaner company, Limited. Very long hoses attached to the vacuum engine were passed through upper windows of houses to provide an efficient cleaning service. But the cleaning service became quite an attraction, probably due to its royal patronage with society hostesses. Rather like nowadays, where Tupperware and lingerie parties are held in some houses, fashionable ladies would hold a vacuum tea party where they would form the audience to watch the remarkable spectacle of vacuum cleaning. My dears, oh, if you do, oh. do come in and sit down. We're just about to start. Oh, good. Yeah. If it please you, ladies and gentlemen, we will now demonstrate Mr. Boo's marvellous vacuum cleaning surface and suck out all the dirt and the dust from the upholstery, carpets and curtains. Thank you. Mr. Booth has installed this special transparent one so that you can all together witness the passage of dust and dirt suck up the nozzle and down the tube. Out the window and down to the motor below, where it will be trapped and taken away from your premises and the area. Thank you. Okay, help. Let it go. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. Truly wonderful, Arabella. I must have them rhymed to Eaton Square. I say, look, you can actually see the jolly old dirt whizzing up the tube. <laughs> it's terrific. <laughs> We'll be able to tell the maid she can throw away a feather duster. <laughs> throw away the maid? <laughs> well, as Queen Alexandra herself was saying to me only the other day, it left the palace absolutely spotless. Mm -hmm. Alex and I are, of course, great friends. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you'll excuse me, uh, ladies and gentlemen, at uh, the settee, I oh, think oh. you will find tons of dirt there. I say, <laughs> jolly strong suction, what's it? What? Don't you pull it out? So maybe the vacuum cleaner company was not quite so unscrupulous as that. Oh, sorry, lady, I just sucked up your 18th century carriage. <laughs> died and Booth and other inventors put their minds to smaller machines that could be sold for internal and domestic use. This one was operated by a rocking chair bellows. Oh, Waddy, don't go off to sleep. Keep on walking. I haven't finished the carpet yet. But that was quite a device to take around the house. And now we'll do the bedroom, Waddy. 
Well, if you think I'm going to carry this chair upstairs, you must be off your rocker. <laughs> right. <clears throat> Electricity and the electric motor finally helped a San Francisco manufacturer to make the first portable electric vacuum cleaner for domestic use in 1905, which has led to the whole range of vacuum cleaners today. There's the upright sweeper type, the cylinder type with its long tube and whole array of nozzles. There's even a vacuum cleaner like a hovercraft. But from cleaning to disposal, waste disposal, and a rather delicate matter of personal cleanliness. The lav, the loo, the bog, the john, or the little room where you go to powder your nose has to be one of the places or devices, I suppose, that we take for granted more than anywhere else in the house because we need to use it so regularly. But the WC, or water closet, has a complicated, long and involved history. But it's basically this man, Sir John Harrington, a godson of Queen Elizabeth I, a poet, wit and raconteur, who first invented one and had it installed in 1589. I had my invention erected at my home at Kelson here, near Bath. Near Bath. Appropriate, what? It solved the unfortunate problem of disposing of waste in the privy. It costed me but the whole charge, 30 shillings and 8 pence. My godmother, Her Gracious Majesty Elizabeth, has had my design copied and installed at her palace at Richmond. Sir John Harrington wrote about its installation and design in a satirical and rather naughty book entitled The Metamorphosis of Ajax in 1596. The title of my satire is somewhat of a pun. Ajax, Ajax, is our Elizabethan word for privy, or lab. I've included some of my illustrations in it. A plan plot of a privy in perfection. The water closet he designed actually contains most of the elements of a modern loo. A seat with a pan, a cistern or tank of water, note the little fish swimming in it, an overflow pipe, a flushing pipe with a stopple or valve, and a water pipe with a water seal leading to a soak away or cesspit. It's interesting, in his illustrations, he's depicted Archimedes, the father of Eureka, overseeing the plans. But when Queen Elizabeth read the Ajax books, she was not amused. It is not so much the indecency of your books on Ajax, Ajax Harrington. We like the idea. We have a sensitive nose, and we have set an example of a personal cleanliness to the whole court. Do we not take a bath once a month, whether we need to or no? No, it is not your irreverency and indecency we complain of, but certain innuendo references to the Earl of Leicester's state of moral, nay, decent manner. We order you to leave the court until you have grown more sober. Her gracious lady refused me entry to the court for three years and refused the license of the printing of my three books on Ajax. He was later forgiven by the Queen and made a knight for services in Ireland, not for services to the bathroom. But Harrington's water closet did not become popular. The majority of Elizabethans were pretty indifferent to dirt. And the limitations of water supply and the absence of drains or sewers also made it either impractical or too expensive to install water closets. So the habit of emptying household privy buckets straight into the street continued. It wasn't until 1775 and 1778 that the first ever patents appear for what was called the valve closet. I am a watchmaker of Bond Street. My name, Alexander Cunning. I have just invented my valve closet of 1775. 179 years after Ajax. It has an overhead supply system, a valve flush with pull-up handle, and a siphon trap. Water introduced into the bowl is kept down at a low level by my slider. The stink trap is of such a construction that the contents shall or may be emptied every time the closet is used. Aye, that's a trouble, Cummings. Shall or maybe, that valve of yours causes lots of problems. 
Pet jams. Uh, you are Joseph Brahm, the cabinet maker, are you not? Aye, oh, and inventor. I've been making cabinets for your valve closet and have greatly improved on the valve. Instead of loosely sliding, it seats itself with a cranking motion. Cranking? Aye. Cranking. cranking. Mm. My patent of 1778, the Brahma. I wish you all success in yours, Brahma. Aye, and you and yours, Cummings. After you. After you. It was Brahma's design of valve closet that won and lasted for over 120 years. And after an engineer called Joseph Bazalgette had introduced his great London sewerage and drainage system in 1865, the development of cleaner and better loos have led to the most modern we know today. Here we are in Shepherd's Bush, and this is a musical loo with automatic doors. If you're inside too long, the doors will open automatically to make sure that you're all right. But it costs you 10 pence to get in. That's 25p dearer than it would have cost you in 1970. Well, all this has come a long way from the very first public lavatories with water closets, which opened in 1852 at number 95 Fleet Street. And that was a gents. Very first ladies didn't open till, till nine days later in the Strand. And they'd come a long way from Sir John Harrington's invention. It's probably more than a shame that the poor old Elizabethans didn't have air freshness around. Today, though, we have instant fresh air sprayed from the can. And just look at the number there are for spraying fresh air, deodorant, paint, shaving foam, string, all manner of things from the aerosol spray. It's only been around for about 50 years, and some people have said its invention has caused more problems to the air and the atmosphere than it's worth. In October 1931, a Norwegian engineer and inventor called Erik Rotheim patented the world's first aerosol spray, which described a pressure container filled with condensed hydrocarbons and fit it with a valve to dispense liquid soap, paint, cosmetics, and insecticide. It was a pretty large and unwieldy flask, but the idea didn't catch on for domestic use or commercial production. But then, in 1941, in America, Messrs. L.D. Goodhue and W.N. Sullivan. Hi, Sullivan. Hi, Goodhue. Happy Easter. Thanks. <laughs> well, I've got the little biters here, yeah. cockroaches in there, and the flies are in there. <laughs> That's my wife. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Mrs. Sullivan. This is my wife, Mrs. Sullivan. Hi. Will. Will's the entomologist at Beltsville Laboratory, Maryland. <laughs> we being the collaborating of the Department of Agriculture. Oh. Mm. Pleased to meet you, Mrs. Sullivan. Happy Easter, by the way. Oh, I'm sorry. The flies in here are impossible. Well, with your husband's new invention, we should solve that for all time. Yeah, playing around with cockroaches and beetles and the like. I can't stand them. Yeah, yesterday, yesterday, Will, I did it in the laboratory. Easter Sunday, that was, Lyle. Yeah, I used a Freon 12. That's a dichlorodifluoromethane. A what? A dichlorodifluoromethane. Oh. Yes, it's a known flammable refrigerant gas of low toxicity. Yeah, a uh, propellant, an insecticide pyrethrum and sesame oil introduced into a thin five-pound canister under pressure. And it sprays perfect. Now, don't you go doing that laboratory stuff in here, love. But that's it, honey. This is the place. Okay. <laughs> what do you want to start with, then? The roaches or the flies? The roaches. Okay. Yeah. They're all lying on their backs now. All dead. We've done it. The flies will. Will what? Die. Could you? Good you? I will, Will. <laughs> <laughs> And once again, the chamber of flies were sprayed with a prototype aerosol and were all on their backs in 10 minutes. They filed patents on the 29th of July, 1941, and the modern aerosol was born. Then, at the end of the same year... Ben, Japan's just attacked Pearl Harbor. We're at war. Oh, Lyle! December the 7th, 1941, and America was forced into the Pacific War by the Japanese. And it was this war that was to have a remarkable effect on the development of the aerosol. During 1942, more American soldiers were killed by disease in the Pacific than by the Japanese. And the killer diseases were transmitted mainly by insects. The insect spray was rapidly developed with war effort money by Goodhue and Sullivan and sold to the armed forces. These first insect sprays were affectionately christened bug bombs by the U.S. troops and their efficient use saved thousands of lives. After the war, a surplus of bug bombs found their way onto the American domestic market and Mrs. Goodhue wasn't the only one to benefit from the use of insect aerosol sprays instead of the old SWAT. 
It's now become a world of dispensers. Just look at all these aerosol products. And now we come to one of the great controversies which this invention has produced. And if the good hues and the Sullivans were to return now, they'd be extremely surprised. My, my! To think all these products have come out of your wonderful invention, Lyle! I foresaw it all. Spray on everything. Spray on soap, spray on hairspray, spray on shoe polish. <laughs> hey, say, what about spray on butter or spray on bread? <laughs> Spray on gravy, spray on mashed potato for instant meals. Hey, what about spray on makeup? Oh, don't be ridiculous. You can't spray on makeup. Uh, you can do it with a spray on face. Oh, <laughs> and you going thin on top could do a spray on hair. Hold on a doggone minute there, boy. Don't you know about the ozone layers? The ozone, ozone layers? Now, don't listen to him. He's one of those conservation freaks that believes the hydrocarbons and our aerosols are destroying the outer atmosphere. <laughs> there they I'm sure if Napalm Jr. of Tombstone, Arizona. And that state has banned the use of all aerosols. And I am empowered to seek out and arrest the users of all illegal spray-ons. Don't you know that the gas in aerosol floats up through the atmosphere and destroys the ozone layers? Why, given another 10 years of indiscriminate spraying, and air protection against the ultraviolet rays will be gone. Mankind as we know it, will be doomed. Doomed? Yeah, that's what I said, doomed. Oh, Lyle, well, your aerosol sprays have doomed mankind. Nonsense, so little of the ozone layer will be affected. Oh, Mr. Sheriff, there's a little moth on your collar. A moth? Oh, do something, get it off, do something. I can't steal. Oh. Moth killer at your service. Afraid I'm going to have to arrest you, boy. Sorry, but that's the law. Oh, Lyle! You must be drinking too much red eye. I'm just a show of bats, so sorry, my eye. Whether or not the long-term effects of the aerosol sprays are dangerous to life on Earth is a controversial issue. So, disposal and cleaning have been our themes for this week. But let's go and have a look and see what Wilf, our alternative inventor, has got for us in the workshop. Hi, Wilf. What other weird and wonderful inventions have you got for us today? Well, this is a remake of an Edwardian Andy Stand on toilet seat. Well, I never saw the original, but how on earth could you even sit on that? Well, you can sit on it quite easily when you've got your feet on the floor, but if you stand on it, you'll automatically roll off with these beads, you see? Now, this is called fly fare. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of aerosols are very cruel to flies, and they die very nastily. Yes, we know this. But this one anaesthetizes them. What does that mean? Makes them unconscious. Lovely yellow spray. And they float down, flitter, flutter, flitter, flutter. Yeah. And when they land, you humanly kill them. Like that. I wonder why nobody's thought of it before. Well, it's going to catch on. But aerosols are very nasty, you know, because they destroy the ionosphere. Yeah. But you can kill them with French chalk. Mm -hmm. But you need this special applicator, which you sprinkle the French chalk on. And when the fly comes along, you go, like that, and the French chalk kills it. They die sneezing, or what? Well, emits the sound of the bull fly. So if there are any lurking female flies around... In the mating you season, see. you go... <coughs> it doesn't sound like much, but in minutes, this place will be full of flies. Well, before it fills up, I better say goodbye, and we'll be back next week looking at food. When we'll be looking at the invention of the potato crisp, the baked beans, and macaroni. Mm. Till then, bye-bye. Bye-bye. before the flies come...